I, had to, I couldn't resist that. Um, first and foremost, it's been fantastic uh, having these lovely people here over the course of the, the two days. It's been a wonderful, wonderful event. And uh, we're going to finish off tonight with some fantastic cases of ghosts, poltergeists, UFOs, etc. Now, like I said at the, the start of the day one, which was yesterday, I've always been interested in strange phenomena. Ever since I was a wee boy growing up in Scotland, um, I had this fascination. I had this fascination for all things spooky and weird. Uh, but I didn't think there were any relevance to it. I didn't think there were any validity to claims pertaining to ghosts, poltergeists. I'll be honest with you, I thought it was complete and utter nonsense. But it's like anything else. Once you get involved with the subject, once you physically get your hands dirty and spend many, many nights in haunted houses, which I have done on many occasions, and as I said yesterday, I've had my hair pulled. I've been slapped by nothing, nothing. And it's when you get in those environments, that's when you come off that proverbial skeptical fence. Now, some of you may be sitting in the audience saying, oh, I don't believe that. And I'm not here to convince you. All I'm here to do this evening is just show you some bits and bobs about things I've been involved with over the years and let you make up your own mind. You can make up your own mind as to what you hear this evening. And it goes to say that uh, as a young boy, as I said, growing up in Scotland, I had this fascination with all things weird and wonderful. And probably, <laughs> probably one of the, the biggest things that really captivated my interest in things weird was, of course, the ghost train. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that each and every one of you, at some point in your life, have visited a fun fair in Blackpool, Skegness, Southport, wherever, because I, was, I loved it. I loved this family, the Robinson family holiday going to Blackpool, and they couldn't, my mum and dad couldn't get me off that ghost train for love nor money. I just loved going into this ghost train with all these things falling over your face, and etc. Very, very sad, I know. <laughs> but that was a kind of fuel to the fire. That was something that really captivated my interest. Why am I meant to be scared here? Am I meant to be scared? Why is my mum and dad put me through this, 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 this ghost train for me to, to be scared of what? But I found it very, very fascinating. And this is me with the skinny legs and the, the, the knock knees and all the rest of it in Whitley Bay in 1964, many moons ago. And as you can see, we have the ghost train behind us here. And it goes without saying that as the years progressed, I've decided that, you know what, this is, a, this is an interesting subject, all this ghosts and poltergeists and stuff like that. And of course, it goes without saying, being living in Scotland, of course I had heard about Nessie. My father captivated me with these stories of this water beastie, this kelpie, as he called it in Scotland. And I remember um, some years ago, in 1968, we went on one of these pleasure cruisers, these pleasure boats that traverse up and down Loch Ness. And it was a family photograph, and my father was taking the photograph, and he says, OK, Malcolm, put the binoculars down. Put the binoculars down, Malcolm. No. What do you mean, no? Put the, this is a family photograph. No, face the front. I says, Dad, I want to be, I want to be looking for Nessie. I want to be looking with his, I feel, Dad, that this is an iconic shot, that I just don't, he says, come on now. And I did it. Of course, here's the, here's the photograph, that's me. Um, Many moons ago, as I say, 1968, looking for Nessie, my mother, and my younger brother Robert there. And again, again, that was the fuel for the fire, this interest about this beastie, call it what you will, underneath the surface of Loch Ness. This is another family photograph. You're not getting all the family photographs here, boys and girls. <laughs> They'd be here all night. Um, again, this is just me, um, mother, and my young son at uh, Urquhart Castle in the shores of Loch Ness. Loch Ness in the background there. And like I say, it was the ghost train, it was the trips to uh, Drumna Drocket, Foyers, and Fort Augustus on the shores of Loch Ness. It fueled that fire, fueled that interest. And as the years progressed, this is me again looking for Nessie. I think this is 1979. And uh, my friends and I used to go up there on a regular basis. basis. We would camp out there, we have uh, a wee campfire and the telescopes were going, the cameras were going, and all the rest of it. Did we see Nessie then? No, we didn't. But uh, we'll come back to some bits and bobs of Nessie as we go along on this presentation this evening. And I always show this slide because, again, it's just to let you guys know about the, how people can get interested. You know, Andy Thomas, all these wonderful speakers. 
probably share the same interests in myself growing up to read books and stuff, but for me, for me, this primary school book, when I was around about four or five years of age, it was The Man from Mars. Just a primary school book, and I read this, and I was absolutely captivated by this book. You know, this wee guy from Mars came down in a spaceship, and um, he met these two guys in the woods, and these two guys in the woods couldn't believe this, this spaceship. And he went on trips and everything, again, fuel to the fire. It was just absolutely fantastic. Again, as I was growing older, everybody probably in this room has read the, the Pan Book of Ghost Stories. I'm sure we all have. But these, of course, were fictionalized stories. They're not true stories. It's fictionalized stories, but fuel for the fire again, absolutely. Now, I've started to use a few slides in my presentation because I give a lot of different talks. I give ghostly photographs, Loch Ness, UFOs, everything. But I've tried to incorporate about six, five or six slides into all of these talks just to show you lovely people that don't believe all you see. The human eye can be deceived, absolutely. And, and uh, anybody who has, I've seen parts of this talk before will probably have seen a few of these slides. And as, as the slide that you're looking at says, they say the camera can never lie, but can the human eye? Does the human eye really see and provide the brain the true, the true image of what it's looking at? Or does the human eye and brain try and interpret what it's looking at and give us kind of false and misleading visual information? Let us know while we look at how the human eye can be deceived. The first photograph that you're looking top left here, what does it appear to you? Some of you may see what appears to be a man bending down in a forest. It's just a, a tree. It's just part of a tree that's a deformed tree. But the human eye is trying to see shapes. This one here, even more fantastic, looks like the head of an elephant and a big trunk coming out of a tree. And the human eye is trying to make sense of the noise and stuff like that, etc. And it looks suspiciously like an elephant. This is another famous one here. This looks like an evil skull, a menacing evil skull. And all it is, all it is, is just the clouds. The clouds in the sky for a few seconds have showed and moved and parted. And when the photographer took the, the picture, he managed to get this evil menacing skull-like effect. Then, of course, we have this one here. What do you see? Have a wee look at this picture here. Some of, we, some of you will see one thing. Some of you will see other things in this. So have a wee look at that for a moment. I hope you can see it there at the back. But for those who can't see it so good at the back there, and if anybody wants to move forward, don't be shy and join some of the, the seats at the front here. Um, what it appears to show is two things. You're looking at what appears to be a human face and the contours of the tree, the blackness there is the eyes, that's the mouth, and that's what appears to be the nose. But other people we may see a woman walking behind the tree with this long coat on and a long dress. Again, you're just trying to make sense of it. Of course, the, the most iconic one, of course, is the, is the, the, the clock. It's looking like a sad, unhappy face. I'm usually sad and happy when my football team Hibernian get beat, but that's another story. We won't go there. <laughs> and uh, this one here, again, what do you see? What do you see? Two things, I guess. You're looking at what appears to be a guy playing a saxophone or a lovely female face. Again, it's the human eye. Again, it's like, you know, you can look into the clouds, you can look at the flames of the fire, and for a few ble fleeting moments, you'll see pictures, etc. There is a word for it, we'll come to that in a moment. But this is probably the one slide that I like to, to illustrate the fact that the human eye can be deceived. Now, I do want you to have a wee look at this one. Which way is up and which way is down? Look at the ladder. Look at the guy climbing up to the top. Look at this fella here with the rope. Look at the contours. Look at the, and it's so easy. So this is why even guys like me and all the speakers you've heard here over the course of the, the two days, we may believe in all these things. We may, you know, really believe in these things but we will still be so, so skeptical. Even though I believe in life after death, even though I believe in ETs and stuff coming to our universe, dimensional or whatever, I will still find 
a, a rational, logical explanation. I'll try my very, very best to open up as many doors as possible. Check with the RAF, check with the airports, check with the local flying clubs. We open up as many doors as possible to get a, a rational explanation. Just a few more quick slides before we move on. This is a cracker. This is an absolute cracker. Uh, flames of a fire. What do you see? The snout of a dog, the eyes of a dog, the ear of a dog, and it's flames in a fire. This is a a quicker or a, a more closer version, I should say. Fantastic. And this is why it's very, very important for investigators who research paranormal invent, uh, events is to ask questions that maybe some people feel you shouldn't ask. Excuse me, madam, are you on medication? What's that got to do with what I just told you? We need to know if people's on medication or, or anything like that. They're looking to be rehoused. People will say, let's invent a ghost <laughs> and get out of this house. So please believe me, you know, these things can happen. Now, I've got three lovely daughters and uh, I, I've never tried to get my daughters to be involved in this subject. You know, if they wanted to, they can. But my daughter, my oldest daughter, Karen, uh, went to the Schooner Hotel, the Schooner Hotel in Northumberland a few years ago. And the Schooner Hotel, as you can see, reading the text here on this slide, throughout the 17th century, this hotel was listed as a coaching inn. Basil Rathbone, Douglas Bader, Charles Dickens, and King George III have all stayed there. Now, throughout the years, history has taken its toll on the hotel, and tales of murder, treachery, suicides, and of babies being thrown into roaring fires have all been recorded there. The prestigious Poltergeist Society gave the Schooner Hotel the title of the most haunted hotel in Great Britain. Not once, but twice. Now, it's also been stated that there are about 60 different ghosts. 60? Well, that must be a busy place. 60 different ghosts in the Schooner Hotel. And uh, Derek Akora and the most haunted team paid a visit to the Schooner Hotel a few years ago and came up with some startling results. A murdered family, temperature drops, and ghostly footsteps. Most of the strange events occurred in room 28, the room that my daughter Karen and her friends occupied. This is a schooner. Has anybody been to the Schooner Hotel? Hands up. Anybody at all? Don't see any hands. Okay, no problem. And this is uh, my daughter here and the Schooner Hotel there, of course. Now, this is not the actual room at the stayed in. This is, uh, there is a room of the Schooner Hotel. I took this off the internet. And they held a seance, God forbid. <laughs> they held a seance in room 28, and they did the, the shot glass on this, this uh, table. So they did that. And Karen, was, my daughter, was sitting herself on this bed here. It's not the original photograph, but it's similar to where she stayed. She was sitting on this bed here. Her friends are sitting there looking at her. And suddenly, my daughter's friends went, ah, oh, and Karen's looking at her like this. You know, whoa, whoa, what's the matter? And what happened was that my daughter's hair was being pulled up. It's like as if you had a, a balloon and you rubbed it on your jersey and you stick it to your hair and your hair lifts up. That's what my daughter says. And her, her, the hair was being pulled up. Nobody was near her. Her friends were, you know, on the other bed. And she was very shocked at, about this. Now, they also took a number of photographs in the, the Schooner Hotel, and I won't go into this greatly because each and every one of you, I'm sure, know about orbs and stuff like that. And uh, I will, all I will say to you about this, let me go back, is my interpretation of orbs, and I could be wrong, if anybody's got a rifle there, feel free to take a shot. I think, personally, the vast majority of orb sightings are are dust particles. When you're moving along a corridor or a, dust, a dusty, you know, um, castle or whatever, and when you take that flash, boom, boom, the flash bounces off this, this, this particle of dust. The same in woodland, the same in forest, the, the residue, the, the dampness in the air, bang, bang, bang. Now, like I've said before, I'm not throwing the baby out with the, with the bath water because I know there's some wonderful people out there who see orbs appear and ask it to move to the left and move to the right. Now that I can't explain. So I'm lost on that one. But in the main, for me, 
and I could be wrong, the vast majority are dust particles rising up and stuff like that, but not them all. I can't explain the ones that appear and move. And, and people see faces and castles and everything in them, and that's another story. Um, and it's, 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 it's wonderful because I think it's great that I never asked her to get involved uh, in this subject like her father has. You know, she's, she's went and done her own thing, and there, there she's there uh, in this, the basement sorry, in the cellar of the Schooner Hotel, and we have uh, an orb here in the background. Now, like I said to you lovely people earlier, this talk is fairly new. I've only given it twice this year, and um, it's a pot puree. It's about everything. And this next part of the talk is all about James Dean and the curse of his car. Hands up, hands up those people in the audience who are aware that they were ever a curse with James Dean's car. Let me see a wee few hands. Anybody that's aware of this? One person there, anybody else? Lady at the back, okay. So most of you um, are aware of, of course you're aware of this famous guy. He's an iconic icon, famous actor. Famous for films in East of Eden, Rebel Without a Cause. And of course, one of the, the biggest films, Giant. Wonderful, wonderful, good looking guy who was very famous at the time. And we'll come to the, the curse of his car in a moment. But this is leading up to the curse of the car. Prior, prior to the crash, Eartha Kitt and Dean's former girlfriend, Ursula Andres, said that they felt that the vehicle, they felt that the vehicle had a malevolent presence about it. And Eartha Kitt, as you can read here, is reported to have said to, to James Dean, James, I don't like this car. This is going to kill you. Now, this was said while the two were out for a drive the week before James Dean's crash. Now, around the same time, Dean introduced himself to Alec Guinness and asked the actor's opinion of the car. Upon seeing it, Guinness stated that the car was sinister and said that if Dean got in it, he would be dead within the week. Famous actor, Alec Guinness. So, I think we know what happened, but what did happen on September 30th, 1955? Okay, um, James Dean, as you can read here, was en route to an amateur road race in Salinas. He was coming from Los Angeles. He was driving his brand new 1955 Porsche Spider 550, which he had just purchased for the purpose of his amateur racing activities. He was accompanied by Rolf Wutterich, a German mechanic sent by Porsche to support new American owners of racing Porsches. They took a route that caused them to pass through Shalom, California on Highway 46. Now, shortly before the crash, Dean was pulled over by a CHP officer and ticketed for speeding. Now, what if he hadn't been ticketed for speeding? Are we, is it predestiny? If he hadn't been ticketed for speeding, maybe James Dean wouldn't have crashed. And it makes you wonder if everyone, everybody's life is all preordained. Are we, is there a big map for everybody's life? If, I don't know. I don't know if, you know if that's the case, but it makes you wonder if he hadn't been stopped for, for speeding, would he have died? Just a thought, just something I want to chuck out, yeah? Now, at approximately 5.45, James Dean was westbound, passing through the Y intersection of Highway 41, one mile east of Shalom. And at that point, Donald Turner Speed was driving a 1950 Ford Business Coupe, turned left in front of Dean, and the collision occurred. Sadly, Dean was killed almost immediately. Wutterich was ejected from the Porsche and found beside the driver's side of the car. Dean was found slumped against the passenger door, which sparked a long-standing controversy about who actually was driving. Neither Dean nor Wutterich were wearing their seatbelts at the time of the accident. The mechanic was thrown from the automobile and suffered a broken jaw and a leg. And James Dean remained trapped in the vehicle, which was crushed crushed like a piece of used tin foil. He was taken by ambulance to nearby Paso Robles uh, War Memorial Hospital, where he was pronounced dead at 5.59 p.m. The cause of death uh, was a broken neck, multiple fractures of the upper and lower jaw, severe head trauma, and massive internal bleeding. 
Now, what happened next fueled speculation that Dean's car was cursed, or at the very least led a cursed life. This is one of the last photographs I've taken of James Dean before he died, and this is the actual car, sadly, that he lost his life in a, a poor spider car. Now, this is the area and where the accident occurred. In fact, I'll just go back to that one so you can see that again here. And this was the car, the 1950 Ford Business Coupe that Donald Turner Speed was driving. This, this is a monster of a machine. This is, this is massive. You know, it's not like tin, you know, thin, tin foil or something. This is a massive car because you can imagine that crashing into you, which it did sadly. This is the, the driver of Donald Turner Speed who crashed into James Dean. And uh, this is sadly the, some of the photographs of the wreckage of James Dean's car. I suppose not nice to show you, lovely people, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm showing it here just now. Here's a more clearer photograph of the spider car that James Dean sadly lost his life in. And as you can see, it is a mess. It is well crushed. This is it in a garage. Um, James Dean's car's here. Donald Turner Speed's car here, the car that crashed into James Dean. Donald Turner Speed's car is, as well. So it's, even though that's a big, massive car, that still received a lot of damage. And that's uh, one of the police photographs taken at the intersection where the crash uh, occurred. Uh, Donald Turner Speed's car still take, is still sitting on the road before they took it away. And I don't need to tell you um, who's on the stretcher, sadly. This is a, a photograph taken in 1955 and a comparison in 2005. And as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, it pretty much remains the same. I mean, it's out in desert land. Yeah, it, it, very little has changed over the course of several years. So, what's this curse about? What's all this curse about then? Okay, let's have a look at it then. Now, after the, after the crash, the car was sold to a chap called Barris, who planned to use it for spares. But upon the car's arrival at the garage, it fell, unloading onto a mechanic, breaking one of its legs. One of his legs, sorry. Then two phys physicians bought the engine and drivetrain to place in their own race cars. On October 2nd, 1956, they raced the cars using these parts for the very first time. One was killed in an accident. The other was seriously injured in another accident. Two of the tires taken off Dean's car were sold to a young man who later reported that both tires had blown at the same time, very nearly causing a serious accident. Souvenir seeking fans tried to steal parts of Dean's car only to suffer severe injuries. Coincidence? Possibly. Let's not forget coincidence. It's still a big factor in anything to do with the paranormal. But it's a lot of coincidences as I go through the next part. Now, the California Highway Patrol decided to use Dean's vehicle as part of a, of a safety exhibit. Now, during one of the exhibits, the garage used to house Dean's car boof, boof, went up in flames. Strange, because all the vehicles inside were destroyed, except... James Dean's car. And later, when on display at Sacramento High School, the car fell off its pedestal, breaking a student's hip. Coincidence? Possibly. Or not. Then after that, the car was sent to Salinas. But on the way, the car fell off a flatbed truck, killing the driver. Is one and one two, or two and two four? Two, <laughs> two years later, the car fell off another truck, causing an accident. Then, in 1958, it caused yet another accident. In 1959, the car was on display when, for, for no apparent reason, it suddenly collapsed into 11 pieces. In 1960, the car was crated and sent off to Los Angeles, but it never arrived. It disappeared somewhere en route. It just never arrived. 
And this is the James Dean Memorial Junction. And just before I come off that one, do you remember when we talk about ghosts and spirits and what have you, you also get ghostly cat view. You know this. <laughs> you get ghostly cars and, and airplanes, etc. But that's part of another talk that I may get, give at another time. So it's not just the physical human body that can be seen after death. Parts of aircraft and ships and what have you can be seen as well. But you probably know that. And sadly, this fantastic, iconic actor um, who just started out in the industry, who was on the verge of a fantastic career, uh, lost his life, as the slide says here, on September the 30th, 1955. He was only 24. God bless him. Lovely guy. Moving on to Loch Ness. And did you know, ladies and gentlemen, for those who don't know, did you know that we know more about the surface of the moon than we do what's under our planet's, planet's oceans? That's a fact. Who knows what's harboring under the, the world's oceans, and Loch Ness included. A lot of UFO sightings have been seen entering and exiting the seas around Puerto Rico and various other oceans all over the world. These disc-shaped objects diving into the ocean, coming out of it. It's quite, it's more common than you, you would know. Now, as I say, I've interviewed lots of witnesses up at Loch Ness, Father Gregory Bruce, Alex Campbell, who was the first man to really report an essay. And I've spent many lovely nights with my friends around the shores of Loch Ness. And would you believe it? <laughs> would you believe it? I actually saw a UFO at Loch Ness. That's not so strange, you know. It's not that strange because there have been a lot of UFO reports coming in the area around Loch Ness. Now, this is uh, a wee PowerPoint slide. It's not very clever, but <laughs> I enjoyed doing it. It's going to show you how the UFO moved. But the story is this. We were sharing a campfire on the shores of Loch Ness, a, wee, a lovely wee place called Inver Morrison. There were Germans, there were Canadians, there were uh, American people there. We were sharing a campfire, chewing the fat as you do. It was a lovely evening. Beautiful blanket, starry sky, fantastic. And we were over this side of the loch, right? And obviously the UFO is over the other side of the loch. So we're having a wee campfire there. And then suddenly this woman shouts, Whoa, what's up? She shouted at me, oh, goodness me. And we all turned round and there was this, this is what it did. I may have to go back a few times, but if you watch this white dot here, initially it was this big ball of light. And it was going foo, 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 shooting up and down in the sky and it went something like this. It took me three days to do this, I'm only joking. And it went something like that. And I'm going to, it was that good, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> it went something like this. All over it, I mean, to me, I don't think as a conventional helicopter or aircraft could do that. At that particular part of the Loch Ness, the road is, is not there. There is a road, General Wade's road, at that part, but it's behind. It's not as high as that. People said, well, maybe it was a car going up a steep road, shining its car headlights on the low-lying cloud. Possible, but I don't think so, because it was such a, bro a, a, a strong white light. And eventually it stopped. And like a rubber band falling out your fingers, it was away, it was gone. Wonderful to see this, you know, absolutely incredible. And like with any investigation, we checked with the police, as I said before, the airport authorities, nothing. Nothing was flying in the sky at that particular time. And I interviewed, he's not in this talk, he's on my Loch Ness talk, I interviewed a guy called Frank Serrell, who was up at Loch Ness many years, famous for his hoaxed photographs of Nessie. And he, I don't, actually, I don't think it's on this one. No, I don't think it is. And um, he took a photograph of, it was like, an, no, it wasn't a damsky. It was more like Billy Meyer, the Billy Meyer craft. And I, I said, now, you've taken a lot of photographs in Nessie. Um, Frank, yes, I have, yes. Now, this one here, you've taken of this, this aerial object above Loch Ness. Could you tell me about it? No. What do you mean, no? I don't want to talk about that. Why not? And he wouldn't tell me. Jesus. Now, a few years ago, I've got so much to tell you, I'm maybe rushing a wee bit, but bear with me. A few years ago, um, it was during the time Ted Danson would, was doing his film about Loch Ness, and I had a phone call from the, the Scottish Sun newspaper. And he says, Malcolm, if you could ever prove the existence of Nessie, how would you go about it? And I says, well, funnily enough, I do have this idea, I do have this plan. And I'm going to show you what it's all about just now, eventually. I'll just slice them on. Okay, I'm, I'm not an artist. Well, 
Um, so you try and bear with me with these slides. Yeah, this, I've, I've drawn this. Now, can you imagine a big, big boxing ring? You know what a boxing ring is? Of course you do. Now, this is tremendously big. It's going to be secreted on, at, um, just across from Urquhart Castle, right in there. Right in, and it, all these, these um, rods here, one, two, three, four, extend right up to the surface of the lock. And if you can imagine a, a forklift truck driver with a yellow light spinning around, these would rotate only only if this was breached. Now these are cables. Now on these cables are spherical balls containing radio biopsy darts. Okay? Let's see if we can get this. Yeah, radio biopsy darts. And basically what happened would be there would be something inside the central core of this releasing something like a fish puree or something like that. An attractant, if you like. It may sound barmy, but I thought it was good. And anything that comes near this, near, near these boxing ring ropes, as soon as I pushed, as soon as a large object pushed against those ropes, it's like pulling a pin of a grenade. All these radio biopsy darts go, bup, 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 bup. they would go right into the creature, not kill it, neutralize it, and it would just slowly sink to the bottom. And of course, as soon as these ropes were pushed, the lights would go to alert divers, uh, surface boats to say, hey, something really has pushed uh, these ropes, let's do it, let's go down there. And that's the way it would, so the, this is a, a slide done for me by, oops, let's go back, because it's a nice slide, done by a lovely guy called Dave Sankey, who does a lot of illustrations on UFOs for books, uh, for British authors, etc. And he did one, he kindly did one for me of Nessie, so, and I don't believe it's a pleasure sore as well, as well, but we'll come back to that. So this is it coming in there, it's pushed these things. This is uh, the radio biopsy, this is a cable, and as soon as that cable is breached, all these firing pins, radio biopsy darts go into the creature, as I've said. And uh, this is another slide that Dave Sankey did for me. Just, uh, it's a kind of updated version, if you like. And like I say, this is the, the lights coming up. So that these lights would be spinning and they'd alert the surface divers to the fact that something has breached these cables. So away goes the sun guy and he says, eh, interesting Malcolm, very interesting, but unbeknown to me, he went and got in touch with that famous guy with the beard, Steven Spielberg. And he says, we've got this uh, Scotsman here, he's got an idea for to capture Nessie, what do you think? And he rolled the idea by him and he went, hey, that's pretty cool. That's quite interesting, you know. So it made big press all over, not only Scotland, but here in England and the rest of Europe. And he was going to put up the money. He was going to put up the funding for, to help me to capture Nessie. But sadly, like all good things in life, it never transpired. <laughs> sadly, he went on to do other movies and stuff like that. And, but to this day, to this day, I still feel that that's a viable opportunity to really capture Nessie. I may be daft, probably am, but uh, there you go. But one thing you should know, ladies and gentlemen, is did you know that Nessie is protected under an old Inverness bylaw, which means that if you capture or harm it, you could be imprisoned. That's a fact. So this could be me. <laughs> this could be me if I ever get this idea up and running. That'll be me, and you won't see me yet, we are 12. Now, well, let me go back there. I had the very, very good fortune back in 1994. Only a few people have been down in, in the, the depths of Loch Ness on this planet. I'm one of the few people on this planet has been down in a submarine at Loch Ness. This was back in 1994. And this is uh, uh, the submarine that I went down in. It's sponsored by Swatch Watches. It's about 35 feet in length. It's actually a North Sea deep submersible um, submarine and the reason I was fortunate enough to do that is for a matter of weeks or so they were allowing members of the public to come down in their submarine at £69.50 for an hour which is a lot of money for a Scotsman and I had no change left on them but anyway I went down for an hour at £69.50 and it was one of the best hours I've ever spent in my life it was a wonderful hour here just below the water surface is a massive big um, frontal portal, toughened glass portal, which contained about seven or eight very, very strong, powerful halogen lights. And underneath the submarine was another portal as well. So when we were moored at Drumna Drocket, uh, a lovely wee village, it went out there and Loch Ness is heavily peat stained. You can hardly see, you know, seven feet in front of your face. 
Uh, so we went down, let's see what the next slide is here to see what, yep, we'll come back to that one. We went down to just under 800 feet or so. And if you could imagine, if you could imagine that that my hand is the floor of Loch Ness. This is a submarine, but we're at an angle. And it was beautiful, it was sandy salt, very little water vegetation, never saw any fish. You would think these bright lights would attract all the fish. Hey, we're in the fish's domain. Let's, let's, what the hell is this? Let's have a look at this. No fish straight into these lights. So we're traveling along there, and then suddenly, boom, 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 boom. The Loch Ness floor just, wow, fell away, a big chasm. And I said to the skipper of the submarine, hey, can we not go down there? He says, no, 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 we can't do that. We've got to stay to our allotted course. But, oh my God, it was, it was fantastic. And it was the quickest hour and the best hour of my life, but don't tell my wife that. And uh, this is a submarine that you, this is, submarine, this is a, the certificate that I got um, back in 1994, just to, to say that uh, I had dived to the bottom of Loch Ness. Sorry, Carol. And, <laughs> and uh, right, now this fella here, was a lovely guy called Derek Lauder. And funnily enough, um, he got in touch with me just before I did the Loch Ness dive. And he says, Malcolm, i am got a torch and I'm shining this torch up into the night sky and I'm getting bursts of light coming down. Just what that guy, Arthur Shuttlewood, did at Warminster back in the 60s. He, Arthur Shuttlewood, for those who don't know him, was a local journalist. The Warminster mystery is that, well, you know, these guys must know it, the Swindon and being in this area. The, it, it was a town in 1964, it got all these massive sightings, and Arthur himself, God bless him, he used a torch and he was getting these beams of light. Now some people may say, well, we don't really know if it was the real deal, but I think he was. Anyway, Derek followed in his footsteps, he says, Malcolm, do you want to come up to the north of Scotland and, and so I can show you, so I can show you what I'm talking about. I says, yeah. I says, funnily enough, I'm doing this Loch Ness dive, right, I'll meet you. So he met me on the shores of Loch Ness after I, after I had done the dive, and we, we drove in his car three hours to a wee place called Alt Bay in Western Ross. And we went up there to do the sky watch. Now again, this is a mock PowerPoint um, photograph, right? So I've tried to darken this slide. It's, it's very difficult to get some. And we went out into beautiful Scottish scenery. Lovely starry sky. Oh, it was absolutely fantastic. And we, we, we walked to a wee area and he went, this is, this is all I do, Malcolm, this is all I do. And he started, you know, he started flashing his torch into the night sky. Now, I'm standing here on the stage and you're hearing a wee story and you might say rubbish, whatever, but I can only say, by God, this, what I'm about to tell you happened. It truly, truly happened. You may not believe it. I don't even know if I believe it myself. But it did happen because suddenly this tremendous column of light just descended from the sky out of nowhere, a clear sky, it wasn't a, a UFO, there wasn't a structured object there or anything like that, it was just a column of light. And do remember, ladies and gentlemen, that part of the UFO phenomena is light-based anyway. You know, it's not just nuts and bolts craft. And I'm standing there and I had a camera around my neck, going, ah, 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 geez. Ah, it's like most people when they're thrown into this, this low-level, close proximity setting, you can't do nothing. Ah, ah, ah. And then it stopped, it was like, a, I call it a rope ladder of light as if you've got a flim flimsy rope ladder, a stepped rope ladder, and you throw it over a wall. And then it stopped, and then rrr, it went away back up into the sky again. So I've tried to do this PowerPoint slide here to give you a wee idea of what happened, right? So it was something like this, not a very clever slide, but it was something like that. It came down from the sky, and it stopped for a few seconds, and it did this. Oof, it's gone. And like I keep saying, and like I always say, and we checked, it, we checked the police, the airport authorities, we, more so with the police, did anybody from the local area report anything at this time? Nothing to them. Okay. Now, in this wonderful subject of UFOs, ghosts, aliens, and stuff like that, as I said, with early slides, this is why it's so good to show you these early, early slides. Don't believe all you see. But sometimes some strange photographs come up. Is this photograph you're about to see true or false? Well, let's let, let you be the judge of that one. Here are a few of the facts before you see the photograph itself. The, the, this is his testimony. He says, I'm from Concepcion. I've been working in Santiago for a little over a year. And on May the 10th this year, well, that was 2004, I decided to take some photographs at Park Forestal, taking some 10 shots, which I downloaded to my PC the following day. 
I thought it would be interesting to photograph a group of Cabrienos. I, can, I don't know if I've said that right, probably not, but there's, <laughs> there's state police on horseback patrolling the sector. The photograph was taken at 5.40 p.m. from the corner of GM de la Barra and Avenue Cardele Jose Marie Caro in front of Bellas Bellas Artes. You don't get street names like that in Swindon. Looking east. It was a cloudy day. The sun was hidden, for which reason my digital camera was adjusted to low speed. This is the reason why the photograph shows motion. Furthermore, the Cabrenos were some 20 meters distant, so I employed the camera's optical zoom, which added to the blurred result. I'm coming to the photograph, just sit in your seats. <laughs> I attest to the fact that this is not a fraud. We all say that, don't they? This is not a fraud, and for this reason I have made it public. I contacted the staff of CIFA Chile. Okay, here is the photograph. Have a wee look at that one, what do you see? Obviously, it is a bit blurred, as the testimony says, and you have got the two state police, one going this way, one going the other way, but you also have what appears to be dun, 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 a wee guy, a wee man, call him what you will, uh, appears to be, I said, um, walking in between, what well, appears to be walking in between the, um, the horses. Now, is it a trick of the eye? Is it a trick of the light? Is it the leaves? It's fallen on the road and the leaves all grouped together like the, you know the clouds in the sky and the face and stuff from a distance it looks like a wee chap a wee alien call it what you will i don't know this is it in black and white and this is a, an enlargement of i mean let's be honest i mean certainly it does look like a head it does look a wee bent body you've got the, the legs an arm by its side and a, an arm extending out there and it's just a Try to obviously get a better rendition of that. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, basically, this, this is just one in many, many photographs. I, I also give another talk on, I've mentioned about the ghostly photographs. I've got one on aliens. And I kind of usually break it down into three departments. One, what a load of rubbish. <laughs> the middle one, mm, maybe, okay. And then finally, the third part of these talks are, you know what, this is what people claim to see. And at the moment, that uh, appears to fall in the third category. Okay, moving on to our next case. This one I haven't until I've, well, twice this year I've spoken about it, but for a lot of people it's, it's pretty new. Um, like anything, we get reports from members of the public, and I got uh, some information from this couple for, who were flying on holiday to Lanzarote, and they encountered a UFO. Well, okay, nothing so big about that. Well, it is big, but um, even so, this one was in a different aspect because it was close to a commercial airliner, i.e. their airliner. Some few facts about it occurred, as you can see, 23rd October 1994, and Diane, one of the witnesses, said to SBI that they had been airborne about 30 to 35 minutes. They had just left Glasgow Airport, and it was getting light outside. And when she looked out the, the aircraft window, she was initially surprised to see a small military jet flying just below their aircraft. She was shaken up because she, she that was quite close. That was quite close. She's travelled holiday packages before and she's never seen an aircraft fly that close. So she was a wee bit perturbed by that, shall we say. And then 15 minutes later, back into the flight, she took, she's looking out the window again, and then she took what mm, appeared to be a vapour trail heading in a plane's direction. And her husband was also watching this with her, and he went, nah, that, that's not a vapor trail. Because at that height and that altitude, you know, it's, it's, it's a really, really cold air, so you, uh, you would know a vapor trail. He went, no, no, I don't think that's a vapor trail. And um, seconds later, as the image became clearer, they saw what appeared to be a long, tubed-shaped object. Tubed-shaped object, UFOs come in all shapes and sizes, as you know, with no wings. No tail fins, etc. And Diane's brother and his girlfriend were also watching this strange object. And it, it kind of got the arousal of various other passengers in the airliner. And they're all looking out these wee circular windows and going, what the hell is that? And then the object then leveled out and began to fly level to this passenger airline. And do remember, Unless it's a hostage situation or a, a, a threat of life, 
You'll never get any military aircraft or any aircraft coming near a commercial airline unless there's a threat to security or, you know, loss of life or a, a, a scare of that nature. So she was a wee bit perturbed to see something like this in her airspace. Now, as the object was fairly close, they saw that this was a cigar-shaped object. It wasn't really cigar-shaped. It was more a kind of disc-shaped object, an upside-down, very shallow bowl. Now, the bottom... The bottom of this object appeared to be vibrating. It pe appeared to be moving quite substantially, and the top part didn't move at all. The top part of the object was pale grey, and Diane says, I mean, it is difficult to estimate heights, and you know, when you're up in the, in the sky, you have nothing to gauge it against. Of course you're not. So she says, she reckons it was probably no smaller than 500 feet long, but we don't know. I mean, that's just a, a, a for instance, it may not have been that size at all. Anyway, it remained in this position for about five or ten minutes. It never changed its size. It never changed its position. And it was keeping speed. It was keeping speed with the aircraft. Now, suddenly this object started to diminish. It started to diminish to roughly half of its original size. And then, bang, it completely vanished. It didn't fade away. It didn't go into the distance. It just completely vanished. Now, this is the interesting thing, ladies and gentlemen. Around about 10 or 15 minutes later, two military jets appeared. Military jets appeared. They, were, they flew in the same direction of the plane. It was very close. It was green military jets. It remained close to the aircraft, escorting the commercial aircraft just off the left wingtip. And after a while, these jets just drew back. Now, again, I love my PowerPoint. And you'll have to bear with me. I spent many days, days doing the next slide. No, I didn't. I didn't really. But <laughs> this is a wee illustration. Of, this is one of the jets at the, the, the commercial airline. It was on one of these, these um, Air Europa commercial airliners. So, a very bad uh, wee PowerPoint slide here. If you can imagine, this is the, the UFO. And it's, it's very, very close. It's very close to this commercial airliner. And it's moving all around the airline. It's doing all these wee bits and bobs and this and that. And then suddenly, these military jets come into the, the same airspace and escort this wee thing away. But like I said, just before this object moved away, and uh, this is just a, this is actually the witnesses sketch. This one here is the actual witnesses sketch of how this object departed. Uh, done a wee flips like this, something like this. So there's the aircraft. And then this thing just flipped up, disappeared, bang, 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 and was gone in seconds. Now, as I say, I never ever throw the baby out with the, the bathwater because mankind is doing a lot of strange stuff. We're, we're building aircraft. The stealth aircraft was flying in, in America 10 years, allegedly, before the, the American military machine put their hands up. It's ours. And it gave rise to so many false UFO reports. There's some strange aircraft that, fly, that did fly over, not aircraft, sorry, RPVs. It flew over the Iraqi lines to get the troop movements. It looked, for all intents and purposes, like a UFO, but it wasn't. It was just a wee spying device. So, you know, is, was that one of ours or what? We did all the necessary checks. We checked with the Civil Aviation Authority. We checked with air, and it took us ages and ages to get any response back from the Ministry of Defence. We got nothing. We then went to the French um, air authorities and we never got anything. So I'm no further forward. I'm standing here in front of you lovely people with no explanation for this. Was it one of ours? Was it, was it one of theirs? <laughs> um, who knows? But thought I would share it with you. Now, the next part of this presentation is, and I did say it was a pot puri, didn't I? It was very strange. Are there such things as shapeshifters, otherwise known as walk-ins? Now, this is a story, some of you may have heard it, some of you probably not, but this is a story that rocked my socks because it was told to me by one of my very dearest friends, a very tough Glaswegian, tough Scots guy, and what he says goes, and he would never in a million years make up a story that you're about to hear just now. The long and the short of it is this, ladies and gentlemen, that back in 1993, in Boots Department Store Reading, my friend, Brian McMullen from rock group CE4, this is a UFO rock band up in Scotland who, well, I do it talking, they do it musical, just like you saw with this, the, the band earlier today. He's in a UFO band himself. 
The story goes this, well, before we go there, this is the guys here on the Campsie Hills near Glasgow. They have these stage alien dummies uh, that they take on stage to do their presentations and stuff. This is a wonderful photograph of the rock band CE4 with their alien dummies. I was privileged to play with these guys, jam with these guys in their um, recording studios up in Glasgow a few years ago. Fantastic. Anyway, on to the subject in hand before I get carried away or carried out with bowling. This is on one more slide of these guys, yeah. And that wee fellow there, they call him Gabriel. That's the, the name for this one. Anyway, why, what happened? Okay, what happened is this. Go back. They went down to see a fella called Robert Franz, who claims he's a contactee, who claims he can shapeshift. People have seen him shapeshift, etc. So partly they were down to see this fella. That's his girlfriend there. That's Andy Morton, the keyboard player of CE4, and young Brian McMullen, who's the drummer. So they were down to talk about Robert France and his experiences, etc. So they went to, they went to um, Reading Town Centre to go into Boots the Chemist, just to buy some batteries, buy some batteries for your camera. Simple wee thing. So they went into Boots the Chemist, and what happened next? Wow, well, just blew my friend away, and this is what happened. So the following slides you're about to see are not photographs, they are paintings by my friend of what he saw. It's a recreation. I forgot to mention about paintings in a previous talk and they went, oh, that looks like a painting. It is. So if you can imagine a guy like Clive Potter is holding the door. This is Robert France. They went back and recreated this, by the way. So this is a true photograph. They went back, these are the real guys. So Rob, Clive Potter's holding open the door, Robert Francis going out, and what happened next? Oof, my God, this is what happened next. Suddenly, my friend saw Robert France dissolve, and he saw him change into one of these small gray creatures. We call them the greys, there are other names for them as well, of course, They're roughly about three and a half to four feet tall, black inky almond-shaped eyes, no sign of any genitalia, bluey trans, translucent kind of grey skin, he changed. And this is, this is how he did it. You know, as I say, this is just a, a recreation. His body leaned forward, and, and it's not just that. The whole street just stopped. Like one of those, uh, the Twilight Zone episodes in America. All the cars stopped, all the people stopped, were frozen in time. And he saw this guy, and he went like this, bang. And then he was fully formed into one of these wee grey guys. And he started walking off, walking off just out a short round behind the door, like this. And I'll just go back and just show you that again. And my friend was like, ah, he's absolutely mesmerized by this. So he went away like this, and Clive, that's Clive, and, and then he suddenly, he reformed back again to his, his normal self. He reformed back to who he was, Robert France. And he started walking down this pedestrian walkway in Reading Town Centre. My friend's like this, he's in shock. And he didn't say anything at the time. It wasn't until they got back home and he went, how did you do that? Pardon? How did you do that? Do what? How did you? You know what? Oh, Brian, tell me. What? What? How did you? I'm going to swear. How did you bloody change into one of these wee grey gray beings? I take it, I take it you've seen something then, Brian. I take it you've seen something. Yes, I see something all right. How, how did you do it? And this is Brian Miller, and we'll come on to the more on this in a minute. He did a TV show with me up in Scotland some years ago, We the Jury. It's another story. It was a wonderful show. Now, this is Robert France. I'm coming back to how did you do it in a moment. And this is Robert France's girlfriend, Sheila. Now, obviously, Robert France told him, yeah, I can do this. I don't know why it happens, but I can do it. Now, Robert's girlfriend has seen her, her, her um, boyfriend change a lot herself. And one night she was lying in bed next to Robert France, and suddenly this happened to Robert's face. This. He suddenly went into scaly reptilian kind of, his face was scaly reptilian, and there was this kind of string or something was coming out of his forehead. And even Sheila, who knows him very, very well, still got shocked at this. And again, nobody's a fantastic artist. Um, Robert tried to 
well, I'm so sorry, Sheila tried to do a drawing of what she saw, and so half of the face was like that, the other half was just his normal face, and then it kind of got more, as it, as it developed, it was like more of the black inky almond shaped eyes, etc., with a strange, bizarre nose. Um, ufology is not cut and dried with just the grey face and no sign of any nose. Some people claim to see a whole range of things. So there you go. And uh, to this day, my friend says, you know, Malcolm, to the day I die, I, s I swear, Malcolm, honestly, I saw that. I wasn't on drugs, I wasn't smoking marijuana, I wasn't sniffing glue or anything like that. I saw it, Malcolm. And even though he's into UFOs, he's a straight guy, he's a straight laced guy, and, and a spade's a spade with Brian. Now, they say that God made man in his own image. I love using this slide as well. So whose image is these wee grey guys? Do we have one God or several gods? You try to draw, draw my attention, no? We've got time, yeah? Thank you. I hope so because I've got quite a lot to go through. Now, the Livingston UFO incident is a major case in Scotland. I'm, not, I'm only going to gingerly touch you about some of it, but there's a new hypothesis, there's a new explanation, allegedly, about what really caused the Livingston case. But I'm sure lots of you know about it. Hands up who know about the Livingston UFO incident. Let's see a show of hands. There must be more than that. What, only one? Two? Why, three? Okay. Okay, for those who don't know, I'm just going to show you a little bit of what happened, then we'll go into the new theory. It was first reported in UFO Matrix, or the new theory was a few issues, issues ago. And the area in Scotland in question where it happened is central Scotland, uh, near Edinburgh, in central Scotland, of course. Uh, this is the object that uh, witness Robert Taylor saw, and we'll come to that in a moment. But the story goes this, very briefly, because I want to go on to the main guts of the new, new hypothesis. This, this fellow here was employed by Livingston Development Corporation. He was just a normal Joe, a normal guy. He had no interest in UFOs. The stupid, the UFOs are stupid, man. They don't, no interest. He's just, he was employed by the Livingston Development Forestry Department to ensure that no cattle or sheep strayed into the woods. That was his job. He's done it day in, day out. No interest in UFOs. But his whole life turned upside down back in November the 9th, 1979 when he was in this forest and he encountered something very mysterious and bizarre. Now, he was walking down this forestry path with his Irish red setter dog, Lara, and at the foot of this path, it opens up into a clearing in the forest. I'll just move on to the next slide here. And this is when he went into that area in the forest that he was absolutely stunned. Normal guy, normal Joe was not expecting this, not at all. This is uh, another PowerPoint slide. So he's walking up this forestry path. He's walking up there. He comes to this clearing in the woods here and he encountered this massive structure. Now, parts of it seem to disappear and re-solidify and disappear and re-solidify, etc. And this is the object he saw, another illustration by Dave Sankey. Circular object with a flange going around it. <clears throat> and then suddenly they, what resembled, resembled two Second World War sea mines blah, 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 descended from beneath this object and started rolling across the grass. And then they stopped. They stopped about there and started to extend these rod-like projections to his trousers and pulled them at the hip and pulled them very, very forcibly and pulled them down onto the ground. Like I said, part of this object seemed to disappear. These are the two sea mine objects that was traversing the, the grass. And uh, there were over 40 marks, holes and marks, indentations in the grass that was left. We'll come to the police bit in a moment. Um, they were only left in the area, these track light marks and these depressions in the grass. They were nowhere else in the whole forest, just in this area. This is Robert Taylor himself looking at the area where the police fenced, fenced it off. So what's this new theory? But just before we go there, um, basically what happened was that when these rod-like projections pulled him, bam, he lost consciousness. He remembers a powerful odor, a powerful burning smell pervading the whole area, and then he bang, he lost consciousness. When he regained consciousness, this big object was gone, the smaller objects were gone, and all these marks in the grass. 
And the police became involved, and the police said, you know what, we're baffled. They treated it as a crime scene. They said, we don't know what happened here. This man is a reputable citizen of uh, Livingston. He's a normal guy. We have no reason to d deny that he has seen, he claims to see what he saw. Anyway, moving on to the theory. I believe what he saw, by the way. But anyway, just recently, this guy called David Slater has come up with a, a new hypothesis. And I'm just going to quickly go through this because it involves a wee bit. He's trying to say that what Bob Taylor encountered was possibly the, the possibility of a belladonna-induced hallucination. And so what is belladonna? Well, Wikipedia tells us that its full name is Atropa belladonna, commonly known as belladonna or deadly nightshade. It's a perennial herbaceous plant. It's native to Europe, North Africa, and Western Asia. The foliage and berries are toxic containing tropane alkaloid, and these toxins can, when ingested at low doses, induce delirium and hallucinations. And this is uh, the plant in question, Atropa belladonna. So it's David's contention that on this eventful morning of November 9th, 1979, that Bob ingested some of these berries or maybe rubbed them on his, on his hands which even when you rub the juices on your hands, they, they absorbed into the skin and they can still cause a hallucination. Then, after a period of time, some kind of weird hallucination event transpired to create this mind-induced hallucination, which took the form of this wonderful spaceship and associated effects. The plant has a long history of use as a medicine, a cosmetic and poison, and before the Middle Ages, it was used as anath anaesthetic for surgery. It's almost one of the most toxic, toxic plants found in the Western Hemisphere. Now, these berries pose the greatest danger to children because they look attractive and have somewhat a sweet taste. The consumption of two to five berries by children and ten uh, berries by adults can be lethal. The root of the plant is generally the most toxic part, though this can vary from one species to another. Okay, Doctor Who, how does that come into it? How did that come into it? Okay, so David goes on. So this is a forestry worker. He knows his stuff. He knows his plants. He's, tra he's walked this forest many, many times. Why does he want to stop? I'm going to digest these poisonous berries, by the way. Come on. So anyway, David goes on, and, and uh, this is not a slur on David, by the way. I mean, I, I'm, I, David, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Come on, the coin in your pocket has got a head and a tail. And nobody should laugh at something because it looks ridiculous. I've said that before. Anyway, Doctor Who, how does that come into it? Well, just a few weeks prior, before Robert Taylor saw what he saw, his UFO, the BBC aired a brand new series of Doctor Who entitled The City of Death. Now, the opening sequence was depicted an alien spacecraft rising from a strange landscape. And the image that accompanied David's article does look very, very similar. And you'll see that in a minute. This is it here. If you take those legs off, it looks quite similar to what Robert Taylor saw. The object in Doctor Who was spherical. It was composed of dark metallic material. It had a porthole and a flange around its, its center and vertical poles rises up from the flange. And here's a more closer rendition of that. So if we take away the legs, yeah, okay, fair enough. It, it's, it's spherical, it's got this flange round about it. And as you hear the next part of the talk, you, you like a jigsaw puzzle, we'll put all the pieces together. This is it here. And this is David Sankey's uh, illustration. It's all quite similar without the legs. Now, David goes on to say that the craft was seen again in the final episode of Doctor Who, which was screened on October 20th, 1979. And on observing it, one character in the show cries out, that's a spaceship. Now, think about this as we go along. This is just 13 days before Bob Taylor saw what he saw. So how about the marks in the grass saying, how, how does that fit in with David's theory? Okay, let's have a look at the marks. As I said before, there are over 30 to 40 circular holes, track-like marks in the grass, impressions, etc. 
Was it made by, as, Bo as Rob Robert Taylor would have you believe, these spherical sea mines moving across the grass? Did, th did, did that make the holes in the grass? Well, David Slater would say no, because he says that when he had digested these berries, his mines away, his mines all over the place, and during this, this beginning of this hallucinogenic uh, episode, he looked at his dog, his dog was there, and as he looked at his dog, the dog's running about with the legs and the tail's up, he suddenly, the dog moved into a sea mine like object. Again, I'm not knocking the guy, that's, that's a possibility, absolutely, why not? We must look at every angle, that's what he's saying, that the sea mines are the shape of his dog in this hallucinogenic episode. What about the marks in the grass? Well, these were possibly made as some kid's den. We all, when we were younger, especially me, had nothing better to do as making dens in woods like the best of them. So he reckons that the marks in the grass were probably caused by that. And Bob visited these woods on a daily basis and says, Malcolm, I never, ever, ever saw any den. Never saw anything like that. So did Bob Taylor see? Did Bob Taylor see that episode of Doctor Who which showed the spaceship? And secondly, has there ever been any evidence that that actual plant, Atropa belladonna, was a, a facet of Deckman Woods near Livingston? Well, I'll tell you this. As far as I know, Atropa belladonna, what happened was I spoke to people at the West Lothian Council, uh, the Livingston Development Corporation, who was disbanded in 2004, where Robert Taylor worked. I got through to another department. I spoke to a John Baxter who put me on to uh, Alan Agnew, and he says, Alan says to me, Malcolm, to my knowledge, there have never been any reported poisonings in Deckman Woods attributed to any plants. And uh, I says, well, are you aware of Atropa belladonna? He says, no, I'm not aware of it, but I can't be sure. I then spoke to Vivian Gray, who stated that she had checked her records for the plant described there, and she says, none. None of these plants have showed up in Degman Woods. And then I says, well, if, if I needed to continue my line of inquiry, I would need to pay another hundred pounds <laughs> to get more information. And as I say, for a Scotsman, that's a lot of money. You know, it's, I stretched to five pounds, no hundred. And basically, could, Do could uh, Bob Taylor have seen Doctor Who? Could, I mean, at the end of the day, let's, let's get to it. Well, I spoke to Bob's sister, and who told me, she says, you know what, Bob, uh, Bob never watched Doctor Who. Doctor Who. He wasn't interested in looking at science fiction. It was not a part of his remit. I said, are you sure? Are you sure? I mean, you're not in the house all the time. Oh, no, no, he never watched it. And then I had a long chat with uh, another sister who said the very, very same thing. She says, Malcolm, are you being ridiculous? Are you losing your marbles? My brother never touched berries. He never watched Doctor Who's. And, you know, they, tell, they told it as it is. He was a wise man. He didn't do that. So, as there were nothing else on the television, we could speculate that Bob did see it. Now, The City of Death was broadcast on BBC One over four consecutive Saturdays, beginning on the 29th of September 1979, and at this time, industrial action had blacked out the rival broadcaster ITV, and as a result, Doctor Who scored very, very high, 14.5 million viewers over the four episodes, 16.1 million watched the fourth episode with that spaceship, one of the, the, the biggest recorded episodes of Doctor Who. And I'm just going to quick, how long have I got? Because I could be here forever, you know. It's not listening to me. Okay, I'll wait till I get pulled off. So was this a real life bona fide UFO event? Or come on, or was it a hallucination? Was it a tropa belladonna? The guy who's walked his, these woods, etc. I agree. I agree with Bob's family that I cannot for the life of me see how a professional forestry worker like Bob was in Jess Wildberries you know, knowing that, knowing that it's going to cause him harm. And I fully welcome David Slater's hypothesis, I really do, because at, at any UFO case, anyone, even back in time, if we can explain it, Roswell, you name it, then fine, let's do it. And even if we prove Nessie is just a big fish, which it may well be, then fine, we walk on, we move away. I'm here to satisfy my curiosity and, and find out answers to life's mysteries. If ghosts and this and that and the other prove to be natural, then fine, absolutely fine. But we've got to get these answers. 
And this part of the lecture is dedicated to the great man himself who he sadly uh, died back in March of 2007. Okay, yeah? That's fine. But this one here is... Well, basically what happened here, this is MV Baron Inchcape. And I speak to so many people during the course of my investigating studies. And this guy says that he was travelling on the MV Baron Inchcape. They were from Fremantle in Australia to Antwerp. That's where the journey was going. And um, the ship was about three or four days out of Fremantle, halfway across the Indian Ocean. And this is the, the area where they were going up round here, up to that area there. Then the first mate came in, he was a radio operator, and the first mate came into the ship and he went, Jim, Jim, come out and see this man, there's a big UFO above the ocean. Ah, get away with yourself, don't talk rubbish, because there was a lot of kidding on and stuff like that on these ships. I mean, time, you know, how, how can you spend your time? There was a lot of Mickey taking and Tom Fillory, shall we say, so he went, oh, can you just kidding me on, come on. No, come out, Jim, come out. So Jim went out, and this is not a photograph of the area, he went out and... Lo and behold, this disc-shaped object is hovering above the surface of the ocean. And he was absolutely mesmerized by this, absolutely mesmerized. And some of the, the, the object it was tilting and moving and twisting and turning, and he couldn't believe it, couldn't believe it for the life of him. And then it suddenly disappeared and shot off and was gone in seconds. We did confirm as an investigating body, we did con confirm that uh, he served on that ship and he logged the sightings on two journals. One of the journals was for the general weather and one was entitled Phenomena Viewed at Sea. And even I didn't know that. I didn't know they kept two journals. Phenomena Viewed at Sea? I don't know about the rest of you, but I've never heard of that type of journal. Maybe it, maybe it is. These logs were sent to Bracknell and Berkshire, and although we searched and prodded, we never ever did find these, these logs. I'm just going to quickly move on because uh, time is precious. I think I've got about three or four minutes here. Um, and we put Jim, we subjected Jim to hypnotic regression. Now, a lot of people say well, you shouldn't use hypnosis on abductees, contactees, what have you, because they may not necessarily tell you the truth. I, I still believe that hypnosis should be used simply because a workman, a workman doesn't go on a building site with a hammer. That's all he's got. He, he goes in as many tools as possible to get the job done. And under hypnosis, it's got to be used carefully. It's got to be used carefully and honestly because people can lie and please the hypnotherapist, etc. So you have to be very careful. Under hypnosis, bang, a typical abduction scenario unfolded. He's found himself in the circular room on this flat bed, and there was a big screen showing explosions on planet Earth, etc. This is one of the UFO forums that we use for anybody. It just asks us, it asks us for details, allows the person to draw it, etc. Height, shape, size, etc. It's all part of uh, gaining as much information as possible. I think I'm, this is about the last case. It's only about two minutes, and then I'll, I'll finish, Chris, honestly. <laughs> this is the last one. Invisible barrier. The world is 